money, spouse, fear, shame, and self-doubt. Those are the five. Time, money, spouse, fear, shame, and self-doubt. You give me any objection, I will show you where it fits into one of those buckets. And this is really good news for you. Because if we know there are five human objections that are universal, and I have tested this in every niche, every market, every language you can imagine. I am blessed to have a global business. I have tested this in every niche, every market, every language you can imagine. Buyers are buyers. Humans are buyers. Humans are human. Buyer objections are human and they are universal. This is good news for you. It doesn't matter where you in the world are in the world today. What I am going to share with you is the truth for you. You need to get comfortable with time, money, spouse, fear, shame, and self-doubt. And I'm going to show you how in a really simple way. Now, here's the first thing to know. It is a hierarchy. Time, money, spouse, fear, shame, and self-doubt. Easiest to talk about, time. Hardest to talk about, shame and self-doubt. You follow? What's easier, time or shame and self-doubt? Time. Money is a little bit harder than time, right? I, I wish I could. I just I don't have the money. Spouse is a little bit harder than that. I wish I could. He's never going to say yes to that. She's never going to buy off on that. A little bit more. We're in your house now. We're getting real. Fear, a little bit harder, right? I wish I could. If I'm just being really honest, I'm afraid to. I'm just afraid. And shame and self-doubt is harder than that because it's like, I wish I could. But if I'm being really honest, I am in a spiral of self-doubt because I have made some bad decisions. I have shown up poorly. I am deeply ashamed. And now I don't know what to do. And that is how it works. That is how that hierarchy works. So you have to know this about your right fit client. You love your right fit client, the person that you're meant to serve. So you have to ask the hard questions. You have to be willing to go there. You don't just say when they say, I don't have time. Oh, you can find the time. I don't have money. Well, we help you make money. You, you can find the money. That's not helping them. The way you help them, you are a coach. You are a consultant. You are their fearless leader. You are the person who went before them. To every third grader, a fourth grader is a hero. You are the fourth grader. You are the leader. You went first. And you have to model for them how I'm going to help you work through this. I'm going to guide you through this. And you start with three simple words. I want you to write these down. They are so simple. They are universal in any language. Tell me more. Tell me more. You don't have time? Tell me more about that. I'd love to know. What, what's, what's going on for you? I wish I could. I can't afford it. Tell me more about that. I'd love to know more about that. What's happening for you? I wish I could. He is never going to buy off on that. Well, let me. I, I'd love to know more. Like, why, why do you think he won't? Tell me more about that. Don't rush to solve it. Rush to serve it. Write that down. Don't rush to solve it. Rush to serve it. And you will realize that all these objections are on a continuum. And what I mean by that is time objections are different. When someone says, I wish I could, but I'm working two jobs right now and I have three young kids, that is different than I wish I could. But, you know, I think I'd have to do that after I put the kids to bed and I might have to skip tennis on Saturday. Hmm. Those are both time objections. Raise your hand if you follow, just so I know I haven't lost you here. So you need to find out where they are on the continuum. Money is the same thing, right? I wish I could, but I don't have the money. Interesting. I'd love to know more. Maybe I can help. Tell me more about that. And mean it. Mean it. This isn't a sales tactic. It's a serve tactic. You're here to serve them. So you say to them, tell me more. And they say, well, you know, I have to be honest. I mean, I'm barely putting food on the table. I can barely pay rent. I'm trying to take care of my mom with dementia and two kids and get them into college. I just don't know how I'm going to do this. And the other one is, e that's going to be uncomfortable. We talked about that spending more money this month. I, have to, I don't know. I have to crunch some numbers on that. They're both money conversations, radically different ends of the continuum. So you have to establish where they are, and then you have to be willing to ask the uncomfortable questions, to stretch them out of their comfort zone, and probably stretch yourself out of yours. Just saying, <laughs> right? Just saying. may have to stretch yourself in the process, right? So time. Here's an example of how I'd like for you to think about time. Here's just a simple, simple way for someone who doesn't have time. Have them take out their phone and look at that place in your phone 
where it literally says how much time you spend on social. How much time are you spending on things that are not necessary? Is there a chance that you could stop Netflix for a couple months, that you could skip Hulu for a quarter, that you could go light on social unless it's for work, like no social unless you're working a plan? I'm not talking forever, people. I'm not saying you have to put down Netflix forever. I'm saying, would it be worth it to you? On a scale of one to 10, how committed are you to this? Would it be worth it to put that aside for a moment while you really focus on getting this result with me? Thank you for the double thumbs up. I love that. I love you're getting this. It's super important. You have to be willing to do it too. If you're not willing to do it, don't ask them to do it. What could you put aside to focus on the thing that you know will create radical change? in your life and in the lives of the people that you're meant to serve. Those are the questions you need to ask them. Not forever, just for now. Money. You are more resourceful than your resources. I want you to write that down. You are more resourceful than your resources. Rarely do we have a bucket of money, a bucket of time, just sitting around waiting to be spent. I got so much time, I just don't even know what to do with it. I've got so much money, I don't even know where to put it. Like for most of us, not a reality. So we have to be resourceful, deeply resourceful. And I will tell you the simplest way to be financially resourceful. Simple, simple. It's called 50 ways, five, zero. You take out a sheet of paper. You say to your right foot client, let's take out a sheet of paper. You do this over the phone. You can do this in person. I want you to write down one through 50, five, zero. And then I want you to start filling, how could you find this money? How resourceful are you? How could you find this money? Here's an example. Do you have a car? You could drive DoorDash. You could drive Uber Eats. Your car's a money-making machine these days. Now, I'm not saying you should become a professional DoorDash driver. Nothing wrong with that, but I'm not saying that's your profession. I'm just saying that's one way you could do it. I have a client who literally went to all, put flyers in all of her neighbors and said, hey, I have two young kids. I'm a single mom. I'm really trying to grow a business so I can support these girls and make sure they're well taken care of and give them opportunities I didn't have. I don't want a handout. I want to do acts of service. It's X dollars. I think it was like $20 an hour. Here's some examples of things I can and will do. If I could help you, here's how to reach out to me. Her neighbors were all too delighted to help her, not with a handout. She was offering a service. She was giving them something they needed. That is how she funded it. I have another client who was like, I really want to do this. She came to me in the back of the room. She's like, I really want to do this, but I just I can't afford it. I just retired and I'm starting the second business, but I don't really know fully what it is. And it just feels like too big a stretch, but I don't know if I can't do it on my own. And I said, Marsha, 50 ways. And she's like, oh my God, never 50. I'm like, listen, the first five are going to be easy, but I'm telling you, go, go, go. The magic comes after 35. And so she's like, all right. Yeah, I could tell she's kind of like, okay. I mean, not really trusting the process. But she came back to me the next day. She's like, Barry, oh my God, you're not going to believe this. I literally woke up at 3 a.m. and I was like, Marsha, you dummy, you have all this photography equipment. She had been an amazing photographer for National Geographic for her entire career. She's like, you don't need all the cameras anymore. You need one. I could sell that stuff tonight on eBay and make this money and get myself started. I have another person who came to the back of the room and said, I can't do this. I'm living in my car. And I'm like, you're right. You need to be in a safe space. Do not compromise your safety. You could buy the book. Don't buy the program. With, with so much love, make sure you're in a safe space first. And he came back to me the next day and he's like, here's my deposit. I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, I thought about it. And I'm like, if I don't do something different, I'm never getting out of my car. I've got to be more resourceful than this. And the next year he was on our inspiration panel. You can't choose for your right fit client. Only they can choose, but you can guide them through the choice. And with the spouse, I want to have a real conversation about this. This is one of the biggest. It is one of the biggest that people do not want to talk about, or they talk about it in all the wrong ways, in my opinion. So before I go there, I just want your permission. Can I have a level five conversation with you? Level, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's just be clear. Level five means like radical honesty. Like we're going to go there and it may be uncomfortable. We're ready for it. Okay. Robert says, yes, I got two thumbs starting to say yes. All right. 
Okay. All right. So I feel like I can talk to you about this because I've been this, and this is how I know. Most of us, our right fit clients, this is the way they have a conversation at home. You make an offer to them, they're contemplating it, and they go to their spouse and like, hey, I want to do this thing, but I don't know if I should. I mean, I it's a lot of money, and I know we don't really have a lot of money, and yeah, no, no, I do remember how we said we were, yeah, yeah, no, I, right, no, I do remember, I, I did buy that thing, and I did do nothing with it. Yes, I understand. Well, but this thing... No, no, I, yeah, I know how I just complain about my business all the time. But I don't want to go get a job. I mean, I, I feel like I'm meant to do this. Don't you? I mean, don't you think I'm meant to do this? You, you don't think so, do you? I can kind of tell you don't think I'm, maybe I should just go get a job. Okay, well, all right, well, I just wanted to talk that out. And there's a saying in our industry, when I heard it, it changed my world. David Nagel said this to me. He's one of my first coaches. And he said, the person with the most certainty wins the debate. The person with the most certainty wins the debate. And yes, I love people who are like, I'm so grateful for my wife. And if you have a wife or spouse who's automatically behind you, go team go. This is not an objection you have to solve, but it may be one your right fit client has to solve. So you have to get comfortable with it. Because for sure, it will show up with them. And it might be a business partner. It might be their mother or their sister or their best friend. It's whoever holds sway over their decision. It's the person that they go to and goes, do you think I should do this? And here's the issue. It's asking for permission, not for support. And you have to flip the script and ask for support, not permission. Are you with me? We're asking for support, not permission. And here's how it works, because you're thinking, I'm with you, but I don't know how that works. So, okay, this is how it works. It sounds more like this. And you can coach your right fit client through this once you understand it. And once you model it, by the way. So you go to your spouse and you say, hey, I need you to just turn off the TV and be fully focused on me for a second, like me. I have had the biggest aha moment. So here's the thing. You know how my business has been totally crazy? I've been like, I complain about it at every meal. I've been debating getting a job. I buy products. I don't do anything with them. If I'm being really honest, I've been a terrible procrastinator because I'm really scared and I don't know what to do. And I turn every dinner conversation into you coaching me. And it's kind of crazy because you're not a coach and you're also not an entrepreneur and you're not even in the industry I'm in. And yet I keep asking you for advice. And I just realized like that is so unfair to you so unbelievably unfair to keep trying to turn you into my business coach. And I want to apologize to you like right now for doing that, because here's the thing that's crazy. There are people out there who do this, who've already figured it out, who have a framework, a method and a process. And I can stop reinventing the wheel and banging my head against that wall and beating myself up because I don't know how to grow a business. And it dawned on me like, when we needed that attorney to fix something for us, we didn't expect the attorney to like just know how to fix it. We expected that he went to law school and got trained for it. Do you want an attorney who like has never studied and never gotten through the bar exam? Or do you want someone who knows and has been taught and trained and is out there in the field doing it? Same thing with like a heart surgeon or anything professional. Well, I'm a professional and yet I'm beating myself up because I don't know how to do things that of course you have to learn. So here's the thing, and I hope you can see in all my body language, I have never been more certain, never been more clear. I have to do this. I need to do this. I cannot keep doing this alone, and you cannot keep being my coach. I would love your support because I have to do this. And here's the thing. If you will get on board with this, it would really mean the world to me. Here's what I will do with you. This is what I promise to you. I will stop turning dinner conversations into coaching conversations. I will show up fully for you and our family. If you give me nights after we put the kids to bed, I will give you Saturdays for golf. And when we get there, and here's the goal I'm setting, and here's the timeline for it, then I will do this. And you insert the thing that you know holds sway over them. I will pay for the vacation. We will go away for three days. I will, I will build a home office. I will, you will be able to quit your job. What's the thing that they most want? And here's the thing, mean it. Then you have to show up differently. You have to honor the commitment that you just put out there. You have to show up differently for them. You have to share the tiny wins. Hey, you're not gonna believe what happened today. First sale, unreal. I told you, wait till you see what's coming next. You have to bring them in on the wins and thank them for the support. 
This is how we do that. You cannot ask for permission. You can only ask for support. Only you can give yourself permission. So the next one is fear. And here's the thing. This is what I've come to know in 20 years of building my own business. You cannot constantly live in a place of fear and succeed. They don't work together. You have to get over the fear. And for many of you, it's the fear of success and the fear of failure. You might think fear of success. And I'm like, yeah, fear that if you're successful, then your husband won't love you. Fear that if you're successful, you'll leave your family behind. Fear of success, of taking yourself out of your current environment is scary. And so is fear of failure. Because for many of you, I know this because I know it was true for me. The only thing keeping you going, and this is true for your right fit client, I promise you, you are mirrors for one another. The only thing keeping you going is thinking maybe someday there's a chance. And if you fully commit and go all in and then you fail, you've removed the chance. You've removed the dream. The North Star is gone. And that's the only thing keeping you going. So stepping up and facing that requires a considerable stretch of that internal rubber band. And I'm here to tell you, I would rather try and fail than never try and live a life of regret. It's better to try. It's better to swing for the fences. It's better to do that than to think, what if, what if, what if, what if. At some point, that North Star will flip on you and that regret will stalk you to your grave. You are bigger than that. You are meant for more. And so is your right fit client. You have to fight for them. You have to fight for you. It is that important. And here's the last piece of this, the shame and self-doubt piece, is that when you make that decision and that commitment and you're swinging for the fences, there are going to be times you fail. There are going to be times that it does not work. And you cannot berate yourself for that versus champion yourself being like, oh, fantastic. That's how I learn. That's how I build muscle. And I want you to think about this. Let's think about this because the Olympics are happening. And here are people who've trained their entire lives for this moment. They have given everything to this moment. They don't stick the landing. They don't make the hurdle. They're not at the front of the run, of the sprint. And you might think, how does this happen? How did they let you out there? How are you an Olympian and you didn't win? How did you not win? How did you not stick that landing after all this practice and you didn't stick the landing? You're one foot out, what in the world? We don't think that, we know that they are in a, the reason they're an Olympian is they are an accumulation of their failures as much as their successes. How they learn to win on the beam is by falling off of it and knowing not to do that again. So if you protect yourself in bubble wrap and you never, ever, ever stretch yourself, you never stretch that rubber band because you're so afraid of failing, you will never succeed. I'm sorry. It's an uncomfortable truth for you and for your right fit client. Your past failure is not a predictor of your future success. Write that down. Your past failure is not a predictor of your future success. Of course, there are going to be moments when you fail. And honestly, I promise you this. Dean and I were talking about this this morning. Yeah, we talk about you every day in the best of ways, in the most loving of ways. Like, how can we support you? How can we champion you? How can we get you to your purpose-driven payday? And we were talking about we don't know anyone in this industry who is not a sum of their failures, who has not had massive failures, myself included. He included. You can't swing for the fences and get it every single time. But do not allow shame and self-doubt to control you. So I want you to think about this for one second. What objection is most likely to make you quit? To keep you stuck? To quit on your calling? Quit on your knowing? Quit on your dreams? Now that you know the five, which one most resonates with you? Because here's the thing you choose. You choose conviction over convenience. You know they never live on the same street. Lisa told you that true words have never been spoken. When I heard her say that, I was like, yes, that is true. Nothing that I have ever really wanted has been easy. 
Nothing that has ever been worth it has been easy. But it's been worth it to stretch, to choose to build that muscle. So right now, I want you to think about this. How do you make your reason not to your reason to? I really mean that. And this is true for you, and it will be for your right fit client. When you are out there with your right fit client, you have to think about this. Yes, Brandon, quitters never win, winners never quit. Quitters never win, winners never quit. Time to put the goggles on, get in position, and be ready to jump in the pool. That's where you are right now. Because you care about your right fit client and their success. So there is no objection you could throw at me where I wouldn't say, that reason why you can't is why you must. You don't have time, that's why you have to do this. You can't afford it, that's why you must do this. You don't have support at home, then please, you must do this. This is you talking to your right fit client. You're afraid. Isn't it time to let that stop controlling you? If you're afraid, then you must have support to get over that hurdle, to stretch yourself. And if you're stuck in a spiral of shame and self-doubt, please let us help you. Please let me help you. Because the thing that's most likely keeping you from your calling is most likely the thing that's holding your right fit client back from theirs. They are a mirror for you. It is a dragon you have to slay, that you have to embrace, wrestle it to the ground, and overcome it. Because guaranteed, if you're like, please don't talk about money, they're like, I can't afford it. Please don't talk about spouse. I would, but my spouse won't let me. I promise you it works that way. 100%. To be in integrity with what you're asking your right fit client to do, you have to be willing to go there too. And, you know, the thing with enrollment theory, this is really quick. The same way you have time, spouse, or time, money, spouse, fear, shame, and self-doubt, hierarchy that descends, as I explained. The hierarchy of enrollment is you. I can do this. I choose. To your family, I need to do this. Support my choice. To your team and your inner circle, we need to do this. We get to choose. This is a blessing. We get to choose in this company. And to your right fit client, I can do this for you. Let me guide you through the choice. Let me guide you through this choice. That's where overcoming objections comes in. So if you have a knowing, but you don't have clarity, you don't have certainty yet, you have to surround yourself with people who do. Same thing is true for your right fit client. That's when they most need you. People who have a framework, you have a framework. People who will hold you accountable, you will hold them accountable to getting clear, to getting certain, to taking action, to making your knowing real. Here, you know, this, this community believes in you more than you do. Dean and I probably believe in you more than you do. We can see a future for you you can't even see for yourself because we've done it that many times. We know you, we've been you, and we've helped you. We've helped thousands of you, and it's going to be true for you too. It starts with the first sale and then the next sale and then consistent sales. You are the four minute mile for your right fit client and for your family. You know that Roger Bannister four minute mile. No one thought you could run a four minute mile until he did. And then other people did too. You are that. And I know this because I am that. I am you. I've made tough choices like this. I've shared some of them with you, but the one I didn't share is I was at a similar moment to the one you're in right now, which is, what should I do? This seems considerably scary. This is uncomfortable action. This is a big stretch. For me, I was going through a really tough time in my life. I was married to my first husband and he had a family business and it was considerably successful, like private planes, all the things. And he had a lot of pride and a lot of ego tied into that business. And it imploded. And when it imploded, it imploded big. Like it was gone in an instant. And when it did, he imploded too. And I don't know if you've ever had to be with someone through something like that and watch them just continue to cycle into shame and fear and self-doubt. And for him, it started with, well, I can't face this, so I'm going to have a couple more drinks at dinner. And then maybe it'd be good to have a drink before dinner. And then, you know what? What's wrong with having a drink at lunch? I'm, just, I'm, in, I'm figuring it out. And then it was like, when aren't you drinking? And I remember just watching him cycle into what really was a full-blown alcohol addiction and just thinking, well, it's just, it's just this week. It's just this month. He's going to pull himself out of this. He's been through a lot. You know, I mean, everybody probably goes through this. 
And then at some point it was like, we can't pay our bills. I don't, I can't pay the landscaper. There's no money in the checking account. All these things that were so normal in our life are gone. And that's how I started my just until business, by the way. I'm going to do this just until he gets back on his feet. I'm going to go to that guest bedroom, the business card, my big idea. And I'm going to do this just until he figures it out. And then he didn't figure it out. And I remember going to him after a year of this and saying, okay, you know, I love you. I cannot do this and I cannot fix it for you. If you've ever been with someone going through a problem like this, you cannot fix it for them. Sadly, you want to so, so badly and you can't. And I remember saying to him, I have a trip. I'm going away for an event this week. And when I come back, you have to have decided you have to have a plan. It doesn't have to be completely clear. You don't have to be completely certain, but you can't stay on the sofa. We can't stay like this. And I went away and I came back. I remember walking in the door with my bag and I'm like, oh, you know, that feeling where you're like, he's already had a drink. Like, you know, when you know, you know. And I remember just feeling like, this is done. I'm done. This is over. Like, I can't do this. I cannot go down with the ship. I can't watch him go down on the ship. I'm not serving him by supporting this. And I remember just sitting down in our master bedroom closet and just crying because I knew. And I didn't want to do it. Nobody wants to leave their spouse. Nobody wants to unravel a life. And that's what divorce is. If you've been through it, you have to unravel everything. I remember selling everything we'd slaved to own, like on our front lawn for a buck 99. Like garage sale, let's get. <laughs> and I remember going to my mom and saying, mom, Brian and I are getting a divorce. And my mom had always been my champion, like my best friend and my champion, like Norman Vince Appeal, Power Positive Thinking Barry, you could do this. You can do anything you want. And I'm like, I'm moving to New York. And she's like, New York? And I'm like, yeah, New York City. Brian and I are getting a divorce. And I just had this idea, like, I'm going to take my business and I'm moving to New York. And she's like, Barry, you can't move to New York. Like, you don't know anybody there. No one. And you're, and you're starting over. And it's like the most expensive city in the country. Like, okay, I have an idea. Why don't you live in the basement? Like we have an amazing basement. It has its own door. We can fix it up for you. We, you come and go as you please. We won't bother you down there. And you can do that just until you get this figured out. And then you can move to New York. Now, I know for a fact that my mother was still my champion in that moment. But what she most wanted was to keep me safe. Who can relate to this? Like the people who love us most are like, I just want to keep you safe in this moment. You seem so vulnerable. Are you sure? But I knew if I went to that basement, I was going to freaking die in there. Like literally or figuratively, I was going to die in there. Like I cannot be 38 years old going through divorce and go live in my parents' basement. Like I will not come back from that. And I remember it was the hardest thing in the world saying to her, mom, I love you and I have to go to New York. I have to. I have been watching Sex in the City and Friends. Like it was my job, like late night, like I'm working, working, working. And I have that on in the background. And I know this is kind of crazy, but I'm like, they're my people. And they live in New York City, which means I should be in New York City. I really kind of had this feeling like all the, all the cool people live in New York City. That's where I'm supposed to be. And sometimes that's all you need to hold on to, to get to where you're going to jump to the next lily pad. And that was my conviction. Like I have to go there. And I remember I wrangled, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but I, through so many miracles, wrangled this apartment in New York on Broadway, of all places. A corner apartment, and it looked up Broadway. Barry Baumgartner from Pocahontas Village is going to Broadway. And I remember it was the most petrifying thing I had ever done. And I also just had a knowing that this was the stretch I needed to do. And I remember like aero bag, who knows what aero bag is, like a mattress that folds up and goes into a bag and you can blow it up, it becomes bed. And I have this thing and I shove like his parachute and some sheets and like an outfit and a toothbrush and toothpaste. And I get on the train from DC to New York. I'm like, I'm going to New York City and I'm petrified and I'm excited. And it's going to be a year of magical thinking. And I remember like literally turning the key in the door and swinging it open. I can still smell like the wood on the floor, like what that apartment smelled like. And I can still hear what those cabs sounded like outside that window and people on the street and all the energy of the city. And I swear it was like a symphony. I was like, this is amazing, which is how it feels when you're living life on your own terms. When it all starts to land and that internal divine rod is like vibrating, like, yes, 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 this is crazy and it's true. This is crazy and it's right. Yes. And I remember blowing up that bed and laying down, getting in those sheets and literally just having like the 
best night's sleep I'd had in years. Because living with Brian, God love him, he's not a bad person, but that was not the life I was meant to live. That was not my life. 